Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm doing well. I can't complain. Absolutely. It's been a long time since I've seen you in person, so it's good to see you this way. Yes, it is. I uh, I miss my uh, my my regular contact with the Brown family. It is uh, it is one of those things that the Hester family looks very forward to, and so it has definitely been uh, it has definitely been a, a strange and unique time, and uh, and and missing seeing people in person is one of them. But so it is good to see you virtually. Thank you so much. May I ask you to please tell us your name and share anything about yourself you feel comfortable sharing? Sure. Um, my name is Nathan Hester, and I am uh, professionally, I'm the Director of Assessments and Accountability for Durham Public Schools. Uh, I'm a longtime educator and administrator. I spent five years as a teacher in the Chapel Hill schools. Um, became an administrator at three schools in Chapel Hill, and um, but I've lived uh, my post-college life all in Durham, North Carolina, and um, and so moved to Durham Public Schools. I've uh, just completed my 13th uh, year in Durham Public Schools. And uh, so a total of 24 years as an educator. And um, so that's me professionally, uh, personally. Uh, again, I'm a, a, I've actually lived in Durham longer than anywhere else now. I grew up in Raleigh, so just right down the street. And uh, you know, went to UNC Chapel Hill, two time grad from there with my undergrad and graduate. And um, I have been married 22 years to my wife, Heather, and we are blessed with a, an amazing uh, child, Maria, who is a sophomore at the creative School for Creative Studies here in Durham and um, uh, is 15 years old and just an amazing, amazing kid. Um, and uh, has a strong connection to the other person on this Zoom call right now. She, uh, she and Ms. Rochelle are, are bonded through fruit. Um, yes, we are. I miss my Maria. I haven't yeah. seen her in a minute. Yeah. So that when we get back to normal, I've got her fruit ready. <laughs> right. Yeah. Nothing has changed. Nothing <laughs> she, has still changed. Loves it. she still loves it. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, as an educator, I've been very fortunate to, to work with just thousands of people, you know, throughout my career, uh, mostly little people. Um, I've spent my entire career within the um, the school setting with an elementary school, so kindergarten through fifth graders. I uh, followed some of them here and there, you know, through their middle school and high school journeys. It is crazy to see them now on social media having kids and jobs and stuff like that. It makes me definitely feel old. Um, but I've also worked with a lot of grown ups as well, and it's what I do now in, in my, my world of, of assessments and accountability. I do more working with adults than I do directly with students, but um, always looking for the way that, that I can be of service and help. Uh, others and um, you know, just grateful for, for all the relationships I've built. You know, getting to know you, Rochelle, is you know, come through and skip, uh, and you know, building that relationship since Frank program. And you know, <laughs> that actually, 15 years ago, I got to know him because that's the year Maria was born, yeah. my first year uh, there. So it was uh, great to you know to develop friendships and, and relationships over the years, and uh, so it's really great to. Uh, to continue to do that, and I'm just grateful for the opportunity to chat with you. Uh, we, are, I am too. I am very much uh, grateful for that. I, you, you beat me to the punch, but I was going to ask you how you know us. But I like to go back and ask, uh, starting with your relationship with Skip. So um, you were his principal uh, at Frank Porter Graham. Can you talk a little bit about how the two of you became so close, and and about the relationships relationship that you have with him? and ultimately his family and your family? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things. So I had just come on board at, at Frank Porter Graham and the principal, I was the assistant principal and the principal at the time, um, you know, had made a couple of new hires and things like that. And uh, so, I mean, it was a whole new staff to me. So Skip was no different than any other teacher on campus, so to speak, and that everybody was new to me. Um, but for both of us, you know, we were two of the newbies at the school. So uh, that was sort of, you know, I uh, think number one, you know, we're both male educators. That's, an, that's another thing that just kind of draws you together. Um, but I think our, our, our interest in work around equity, and at the time that was a uh, still relatively new um, uh, initiative, as they like to call things in education in Chapel Hill, was around uh, deinstitutionalizing racism in schools. And so each school had a team of, of teachers that was called their equity team. And so 
the administration, of course, is a, it has to lead that, but uh, they develop a team of, of representative teachers throughout the, the school to kind of help build the capacity within the school to have conversations about uh, race, its impact on their uh, students within their own schools and, you know, the communities that they, they're in. So we definitely um, got to know each other on a very personal and deeper level through that work uh, at Frank Program. And, um, and so, you know, so, so I think that that's what, from, from my perspective, that's definitely what, um, uh, one of the, the big things that kind of drew us together was, was our, our, our interest in taking action and being, um, uh, you know, being of service to that work. Now, the other thing that I would just say generally is that, you know, Skip is just a very open and easy to talk to person and, um, and so I just, I mean, I've just felt comfortable. I mean, I felt like I could be vulnerable. I felt like, I, I mean, I'm not a perfect person and I made mistakes and, but you know, you know, what was cool is that, that Skip, you know, even if, even as somebody who was engaged in that kind of work, if I made a mistake or, or if there's something I just didn't know and hadn't learned yet, you know, he was not one to push me away and be like, well, you're an idiot. You know, he was one of those, let's, let's talk about it and figure it out kind of guys. And, um, and so, so there's that report too. So there's just a level of comfort in general. So, um, so our relationship was one where, you know, we were easily able to balance sort of that, you know, you know administrator teacher, you know, relationship. And at the same time, I mean, we allowed each other to, I feel like to really help each other grow through, um, you know, through equity work in particular, which just brought us to a more, um, personal level because that work is very personal. And, uh, you know, then you start sharing about your families and you share, you start talking about your interests and whatnot. And now I was only at Frank Portogram a couple of years and, you know, but once I ended up in, well, we never lost touch. And, um, and interestingly enough, you know, because of that separation, I'm no longer as assistant principal. And then, you know, then you start getting an invite to, you know, it's my birthday. It's uh, we're celebrating my family's got this going on. My son's graduating. We're having a little get together. My wife's getting her doctorate. Let's get together. And this, so there's these, family moments that uh, you, you begin to, you know, to take, you, I mean, you know, you develop even more relationship with the family, but so we kept in touch even after I left Frank program. And then, you know, I was very fortunate that, you know, um, when I was the principal at, at Creekside Elementary in South Durham uh, for a couple of years and, you know, and Skip was looking for, uh, for a, a change for him. And I was like, please come my way. Like I knew like he's the exact kind of teacher I needed in my school. And, um, and, you know, so it was, so just keeping those connections and just, it just, it, it became, it became a friendship. And, and I can't say that about every relationship with a staff member that I've been with in the seven schools or six schools that I worked in between Chapel Hill and, uh, and Durham. Um, his is actually a very unique relationship where it's gone well beyond just, um, you know, checking in or seeing each other at a, at a professional development, and, you know, whatever, or commenting on something on Facebook. I mean, we actually care deeply about each other, our families do. And I think, you know, you know, I, I think I'd said one, one of the, when you got your, your doctorate or from law school, um, graduated from law school, I mean, it's, I just feel part of the Brown family. Like I feel like an extended part of the family. And so just the power of relationships, um, but it all started with being two, two new dudes at the school. And, uh, but, you know, really bonding through the, the equity work that we were both engaged in. And then that, even after leaving, you know, just sort of blossomed into more of a personal friendship than a, an even so much professional. Let me correct it. I have my doctorate in higher education. I went to law school and I couldn't handle it. So I ended up going to get my doctorate in education. But the reason why I asked you that question was because there's something about the Hesters that I think is unique to the Hesters. Um, we, of course, are a black family and you are a white family. And in a lot of ways, we feel like you are our family too, you know, not, not by blood, of course, but just like a part of our family. And I think that in this moment in time where we are, you know, what the Hesters bring to the table is empathy, understanding, interest, and a willing to be with you in a way that you don't feel uncomfortable because I'm sure as you know uh, there's some relationships you know regardless of the race or the gender you feel uncomfortable you can feel you know kind of out of touch with it a little bit and what we have had with the Hesters 
is a 15 year relationship that delves in every corner of our lives, not just, you know, the social, hey, somebody's having a birthday or somebody's graduating, but like we know so much about each other. Uh, in fact, we were both in Mexico at the same time and ran into each other, <laughs> you know, so, you know, there's really a commonality. And I think that there, what's really important about that and the point I'm trying to make is that I don't think it's a correct statement to say you don't see race, but I will say what I know about you and your family is that that's not a criteria for a relationship. You know, you don't have to be white or you don't have to be this. You, you have a very diverse group of friends from all ethnicities. And uh, we see that in everything you all do. And I was chatting with a woman earlier today and she mentioned the Curb Herb, Herb Street uh, story. I don't know if you saw it on ESPN where he broke down when he was talking about how these things were continuing to happen. And I thought of you immediately because uh, not only do you look a little bit alike, but not only that, um, you know, you come from the same position, right? That you bring fairness and kindness and generosity to every space you're in. And uh, the fact that you and, and, and Heather have been married as long as you have really speaks to the kind of people you are because I've never seen you all on the wrong side of the page. I've never seen you all are always right there for your friends and your community. And for that, I'm grateful. In fact, right now you have on a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. Uh, there you go. Absolutely. Um, and so in these times where black and brown people find themselves estranged from their country, at odds with their country, in fear of their country, in fear of a structure that has been in place for a long time. What are your thoughts about what you see and how you see this, what's happening is black men being shot and killed and knees and master in their necks. I mean, what are your thoughts about that considering the lens in which you see the world? Um, so, First of all, thank you for for the for the additional uh, you know sort of caveats around our relationship and um, and it's funny because Heather had just posted something on um, she's you know doing a lot of reading herself just you know sort of like you know growing her own journey through understanding you know the impact of race and racism in this country and um, and so she she had me I, I swung by the house for lunch the other day to to do something she's like can you read this real quick and it. You know, she just finished her first book of many that she's planning on reading and you know, talked about, you know, she's, so she was talking about her, her evolution from becoming colorblind to not being colorblind. Uh, that, that, that term, you know, she, she now realizes that it, that, it, that it sort of pushed out a certain part of the experience. And so, you know, I, what she wrote, I thought was authentic and on point. I had nothing really to, say, <laughs> to, to critique it about, but the only thing that I said as far as how it connected to, to my experience was, you know, I describe myself as color conscious versus, you know, anything else. So, you know, you know, because, you know, people naturally want to say, I don't see color. I want to, because, because they want to, to buy into that. I treat everybody the same. And, and, and we should espouse to treat everybody the same. There's nothing wrong with wanting to do that. But we have to do it with a, or I have to do it with a consciousness around how this impacts my interactions with other people and how, if I'm interacting with a person of color, especially someone I don't know, how this impacts it, but also for me to be open to understanding and building my own knowledge around someone else's experience, because it's an experience that I can't say I've had or will have. Um, and so that kind of, you know, I can push that into, you know, where we are today, um, where, you know, you know, so, so my, my understanding and consciousness around, you know, the, the, systemic nature of racism in this country really did not take root until um, uh, I had gone to a professional development when I was in Chapel Hill uh, that sort of led me into that work, you know, throughout within the district. Um, and what I've told people is that it was, it was not only just a PD, it was not a, it was more of a personal development than it was a professional development, to be honest with you, because um, I, I do believe that, that it is difficult for people to, to make change unless, unless there's a change in the first order, uh, or, or, or second order rather. First order change is easy, policy, uh, procedures. Like we can rewrite laws, I can give you a book to read. I can fill your head with words and, and, and definitions and understandings and interpretations. And, uh, and I can write a law that says don't do this or else, you know, things like that. But there has to be a second order change of a willingness, your attitudes, your values and beliefs that have to shift 
in order for there to be a moral imperative to make things different, to take action, to say things differently, to think differently. And, and that's where, it, and, and I was on a tipping point for, for a while, for, you know, throughout this, it was a two-day professional development, and it, it wasn't until well into the second day before I, I finally jumped off the cliff and, and finally kind of had a little pull. Oh, wow. But what it, what it did is it definitely lifted a, a bit of a set of blinders that it's easy for white people to walk around with uh, in the United States. And, um, and look, I considered myself to have grown up in a very open-minded, progressive, you know, just kind of middle-class home, mom, dad, two brothers, two dogs. I mean, you know, but, you know, progressive, we are inclusive, blah, 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 this kind of stuff. And I would have told you, I, I would have said, I got black friends. Woo. But, 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 you know, growing up, I didn't really have black friends. I had black acquaintances. I had plenty of black acquaintances and people that I knew and that I was respectful towards. And we would, you know, chat at school or chat at work. Um, I didn't have friends that were, you know, black or brown. And, uh, um, and so, 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 so the first thing I would say is that there, you know, as, as it pertains to the, to what's going on now, uh, it's, it, A, it's nothing new. Uh, there, you know, the, the, the system, the, the systematic and systemic racism has been built over, as, as, you know, people have been saying for a long time, hundreds of years. But, you know, I think about, you know, that I, I, I can speak for myself personally, so I can only imagine, you know, every individual within the United States has their own sort of consciousness going on in their head. And, and if you think of your consciousness as like a pie graph and, you know, you know, there, there was a big part of my pie graph that there was just a lot of stuff I didn't know. There's a lot. And I didn't even know I didn't know it. You know, there's just stuff I didn't know. But over time, as I've had the willingness to listen, to learn, to understand and to see how I fit into this bigger picture, you know, my, what I don't know shrinks and my consciousness around the impact of race in our country um, begins to make more sense and it begins to, to, to widen and to get, to get bigger. And so and, and initially it's, it's, you know, it's just information, but then what do you do with it, right? How do you, how do you then, you know, take this information and use it for, to transform or to change? Um, and so I, I, I don't think anything I've seen, you know, recently is anything new. I think this has been happening since, um, you know, since the inception of this country and, you know, you know bringing people who didn't want to come here, here, uh, who didn't ask to come here, here, and, and have held them in that, that enslaved uh, position, even to this day. Um, and so I don't, I don't think that there's anything new to this. I think that we've, we've changed what the structure looks like and we've changed how we, and how, how the, um, how sort of an institutionalized power state keeps its power. Uh, we've changed what that looks like. It's gone from, you know, your stereotypical pictures of, you know, people in chains and fields and things like that to, you know, redlining and lending and, um, and the prison system and things of that nature. So it just looks different, but a lot of the same systemic issues are still there. Um, so I think the evolution of this country with, you know, technology, I mean, I mean we're, we're sitting here having a, an amazing virtual conversation. You know, we're able to do this, like, just snap our fingers. And, and, you know, the visual images, however, that are coming out now are troubling and disturbing because it's not just a news story. It's not just written in print. It's not just a, a, a caption, uh, you know, after the fact of, you know, something on a, on a, on a news station. I mean, ev even with the, the civil rights, you know, you know, Heather was just saying to me, you know, we were just talking about it uh, and watching some of the Sunday news stuff, you know, how, how different it was when uh, television became, it came about and the, the folks in the North could see what was happening in the South with police brutality and sticking dogs on people and water hoses and stuff like that, just the, the horrible conditions. They were like, whoa, we didn't know that was happening, but they got to see it. And, and the availability of what we can see these days is just so much, it's so much, it's been magnified like, you know, a million times. So, so there's no, there's no hiding it anymore. And, and so now we're at this sort of, this place where we're, we're having conflict around, you know, people's willingness to, uh, to, to, um, to be able to listen to and, and acknowledge what is actually happening <laughs> without justification, without minimizing, without rationalizing. And, and just to sit back and really, and really you know, think about and talk about what's happening and what part we have in it, not in a way to shame and guilt, but just to say, okay, if, if I'm implicit in this, right? If, 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 I'm, if I'm somehow contributing to this and don't know it, 
I, well, I, I need to do something, right? Mm -hmm. Like I can't continue to contribute without um, knowing that knowing that this this happens. So, so you know, as soon as you've got some consciousness, then we 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 can't we can't go with the I didn't know. You know, now now it's a choice. It's it's a choice of, you know, now you've been presented with this, a, a set of information. Um, you know, what do you make of this, and what are you going to do with it? And so and that's the struggle is 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 using this kind of thing that you're doing to generate conversation and to, and to be able to be open-minded enough to say, I can't shut anybody out of these conversations. I can't do it. I've got to be able to invite people into the conversation because for me, that was the only way I could move what I thought was already there, right? I thought my head was already there, but that was the only way I could do it was because I trusted somebody enough to be able to be vulnerable and say, I don't get it. I just don't get it. And what am I missing? And help me see it in a very personal way, and then it made sense. And so I see, I, I tend to see people who have some personal connection where it impacts them personally, making the most progress, even if they are, you know, politically completely different than me, or, you know, may have just a different set of values and whatnot. But I think that, I think that people move beyond some of those, those, you know, just purely divisive political things when they when they have a personal connection, just like COVID. People like COVID doesn't exist until they know somebody in their family who gets sick and you know and dies from it. Then they're like, oh COVID is real. So um but there has to be there has to be a catalyst. There has to be something there. And so um so it's been it's been encouraging for me to see uh the, the catalyst of you know people just unwilling to let it go. Right? Unwilling to settle for empty promises, unwilling to settle for, you know, people that are, that are sitting in the construct of power saying, we'll, we'll do better. We'll make, we'll make things different without there actually being a change or something different. And so, you know, the people have been like, you know, how, why are they still protesting in Portland? They didn't even have stuff happen there. Well, the, the video of somebody in Portland didn't get out like, like you did with George Floyd, where you actually watched a man die on, in, in front of you, which is in, just, again, insane. So in Portland, there are, there are black men and men of color who are treated the same way and have been, you know, have lost their lives in the same way. It just didn't get out on film. So Portland has a, a full right to continue to protest until they get what they need and get what they want and see the change that they're looking for. Um, so, so what do I make of it? I, I, you know, I would like to say, you know, things have gotten better. I mean, I think that, you know, it's, it's been a, it's not anything new, but I think the I think the magnifying glass is like definitely broad to where it's gonna, it's impossible to ignore, and it seems it seems to me just um, uh, you know it it's not going to come easy though, right? It's not comfortable. It, it it's it, it makes people uncomfortable. I mean, I get uncomfortable watching things, and I feel like I've got a decent you know grasp on what I can do to help, but um, but even then, it's still uncomfortable. Um, and so, but I think that. Uh, I think that we're definitely at a, at a point where, um, you know, I don't think we can escape the, the is it something, it is something, and I, and I don't think there's any evidence that can be shed that, that says it's not, um, that we have an issue with the, the systemic and systematic racism in our country, but um, that's kind of where my head has been, you know, uh, and, and before George Floyd, right, I mean, this has, you know, been, been happening for a while. Uh, and, and my shirt, by the way, comes from uh, the, the year where uh, Kaepernick knelt for the first time and everything blew up about him, you know, kneeling. Um, and so an entire group of students at a UNC football game in the student section of the, of, of the stadium were all black and kneeled during the anthem. And they just got weaned out by uh, a lot of the, the UNC alumni community. Uh, and so a lot of the other alumni community that were in full support of them decided that we would, we would, you know, both give them voice and give them, you know, some, some, uh, the, the, the support that we could, whether it was, you know, through, you know, financial support to keep the, keep the message and the movement going on campus and things of that nature. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so this, this comes from, uh, I, we were actually in California when this happened on fall break and we're at the, um, uh, the planetarium thing way up in the hills in, in Los Angeles and uh, when uh, stories broke and I'm, I'm on my phone ordering shirts trying to trying to see what I can do to 
uh, to, to help the, the cause. And why. it was just mind blowing to see that many people at one time just being united around a message. So. You know, I, I want to go back to something you said in, in, in the beginning, you know, and I don't speak universally for any group of people, but, you know, there are two phrases that are used, there's three phrases that are used in the common vernacular now. And one is colorblind. And colorblind means you don't see me. If you can tell me that you're colorblind, then that means you don't see me. And I am black. I am a black woman. So you must see color. You must see black people. You must see Latino people, uh, Hispanic people. You know, whatever the person is, you must see the color. You, because if you don't, you invalidate them. You make them not, not relevant. Um, another one is the phrase is, that's one of the, probably the most difficult phrase for black people to swallow is I have black friends. That's like saying, I have a banana. Okay, what, what, what exactly do you want me to do with that? You know, I mean, like, thank you for sharing, but you know, what is, it? you know, so usually when somebody says that to me, I say it right back. I have white friends and I just leave it right there. Whatever it is that you think that that's all right with you, I, you know, I have white friends too, you know, so. And I think that one of the things, you know, that you were talking about with Heather, you know, it's like learning where the push, the pain points are, right? So where are they, right? So. One, they're microaggressions, little subtle things that people say that really say something about the person. So, for example, how you wear your hair, you know, you know, things that are really Afrocentric sometimes are seen by other ethnicities as an affront to what they believe. So, kneeling at a football game, what Kaepernick did, Kaepernick did, it's not disrespecting or not being patriotic. It's just acknowledging a moment in time where we need to re recognize this issue. And, and you can't help but, you know, laud him for that, for, to appreciate him for doing that, because it's really important that people recognize that black people, I think I can say this almost universally, love America just like anybody else. We're not trying to go live in Russia or Australia or anywhere. We like our country. The problem is our country hasn't liked us. Our country hasn't had any value for us. The America that we live in today with this prosperity, a superpower and all those things are off the backs of black people. Black men were able to vote before white women. There must be some recognition of what it means to be black in America by other groups other than black people. So, you know, police training, you know, defund the police. I don't think any of that makes sense to me. I think what you need to do is bring resources to the police forces when they're first indoctrinated into that organization, right? So when you became a principal or became a teacher, they didn't just slam you out there in the middle of the street and say, go, you know, you know, and, and I'm sure the police, does, you know, they teach them how to shoot, how to put handcuffs on, how to Miranda rights and all that. But I mean, there's a part where you're constantly reaffirming your knowledge as a principal, as what you do now as a teacher. Why isn't that a part of the discussion for law enforcement? Why is it not that, you know, when you have a domestic violence situation, bring a psychologist, a social worker, someone with you, you know, that can come calm the situation down. When you have someone that's high on drugs, you know, bring, you know, addiction experts into the, to the car to do this, you know. And these are the kind of things that, you know, just really are simple things that could be done to over time reverse some of these things that are happening. But I think one of the things that really has to happen is that there are Nathan Hesters, that there are Nathan, Heather, and Maria Hester all over the world that have empathy, can, can, you, you can't identify with my struggle. You can't identify with Skip's struggle because you don't know it. You know, I don't know if you watch Skip's chat, but I, we've been married 25, 26 years, and it was really amazing. I heard this the first time we did our chat, was he was going to help a friend move and he was driving in a car police suspected had done something and they pulled him over and they're surrounding him with guns pointed at him. You know, so this is my no, no peaks and no valleys husband, really, you know, smooth all the way through husband is in this thing. He's a young man, of course, you know, he's in his 20s, you know, early 20s. So, you know, this thing is happening to him. And for me to just hear this when we we're doing this chat was, you know, pretty, it bothered me a lot that, that that my husband could not be here. My son could not be here if my husband didn't exist, you know? And so people like the Hesters and other people who are able to apply empathy. I'm not telling you that you have to, you know, be in my shoes. I'm not asking you to walk that mile. I'm just asking you to understand what shoes I'm in and why I act and think the way I do. You know, we have not been recognized for what we have contributed to this country. We have not been recognized for the things that we have done for other ethnicities, right? So, you know, when the Latino or the Hispanic community, the 
Asian community, all of these people are riding on our backs, you know, and to not be unified with us, to not be in step with us, white women, to not be in lockstep with us suggests that you don't appreciate what we've done, which is what America has been saying to us since we arrived, it meant nothing. So I, I would just say that to that. But but my, my, the thing that I think that you bring to this conversation that's really important is education, right? So when we were enslaved, we were prevented from reading. You know, there was a black Bible and a white Bible because they didn't want to inflame people and get people upset, you know, so they wanted to change these heathens into Christians and, and that philosophy that they had, you know, but education has always been elusive for black people, right? So, you know, a young black man in a public school system, what's the likelihood he is going to make it out that school and become a productive citizen versus go to jail or whatever else could happen to him? What's the likelihood? Why is education such an anti-success for black and brown people? Why do we find the education system so challenging to get through it? And, and I'll, I'll say just one part, whenever, so Everett was academically gifted since the day he was born, you know, plus he had a grandmother who was always, you know, teaching him something. And so by the time he got to middle school, he had lost his entire interest in school, entire interest. So his grades suffered for it. I mean, there was just all of these things that were there. And it was, we, we found out, you know, much later on when we found out how sick he was, we found out that, you know, they weren't, education wasn't stimulating to him. It wasn't, you know, he, everything the teacher would stand up there and say in a few minutes he understood and she was still blathering on about it, you know, so he lost his interest in school. Why isn't education willing to see education? There's no one size fit all. Why is that still the, the, the mantra within education? Yeah, it's a, uh, that, you know, so as an educator and, and, you know, and, you know, again, that's where I began when I was just fresh into administration is when I sort of began building that understanding of consciousness. And it, and it was within the, the context of education. That's where I was learning all of this. And, um, and so, you know, I think that, I, th I think the, the, the most challenging point of it all kind of comes back to this idea of, willingness and connection again it, it's it's you know it's less about you know it, i mean th there are certain things that you know people can you know school board or more policies the school board can uh, can require training i mean we have that we, we have required trainings that are required of everybody so the question is why didn't that work you know so that that to me is the is the fundamental question is um you know if if we've changed policies if we put these sort of first order changes into place uh, we've gotten them professional development. We've uh, we've put these expectations out there. Well, then why aren't we seeing the the, the fruits of those changes? And I think that you, you can't have that actually be successful without that second order change of one's attitudes, values, and beliefs. And I believe that 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 begins certainly with uh, with the leadership within a, a school district, whether it's the school board to the superintendent to the principal of the school or set folks in central services who then sort of work with your you know, your principals who then, you know, develop and build their staffs within the school. And, and you know, in my experience, so, so just to, to give you sort of same school, same kids, right? And so prior to this PD, you know, I was told for this one community, um, you don't go down there. You definitely don't go down there at night. You know, they just cause all kinds of problems. And so this is the narrative that's being generated. And so it you know, so we, we, we've created narratives around misinformation, which is, is done intentionally to, to, to maintain the order of that, that systemic structure of power. So, and it's, it's stuff that we, we don't even, oftentimes it's a very unconscious thing that we are socialized into. I mean, race is a social construct in itself where we, we have developed these, these and normalized these, these thoughts and, these, and the way that we're taught and socialized through that. You know, you know, you know, black people are angry, black people are aggressive. You know, we hear all these very general statements. And so as an educator, I mean, I heard this about this community. Don't go there. They're, they're you know, you know, it's no wonder they're having so much trouble on the bus. Da, 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 da. I mean, all these kinds of things. So I began to broaden my understanding of my consciousness around race. And I'm all suddenly like, hold on. I'm going to go to the community. 
And I did. I drove down there. I had no reason to go down there. I wasn't, you know, going down for a discipline reason. I wasn't going for anything more than to be like, and I was, believe me, Rochelle, I was shaking. I was like nervous because I've been socialized to believe that this is a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. Something kept nagging at me. I was like, if it's so dangerous, then my kids live there. They live there. This can't be dangerous. I mean, this is where they, so I drive into the community, which by the way, is well hidden in Chapel Hill. They, uh, they take this public housing community and hide it, you know, so that nobody else can see it uh, off the main road. You would never know it's there. So I pull in, and it, and honestly, it's the opposite of what I've been told. I pull in, and there are kids riding around the neighborhood. They're smiling. They're laughing. They're on their bikes. They're playing. They're having a grand old time. They seem happy. Um, I park my car. I just kind of meander around. One of, the, of course, the kids come up. They're like, "Hey, what are you doing here? Well, let's go see where so and so lives. Let's go see where so and so." And they just showing me around, telling me everybody's business and who lives where and who lives where. And, and, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> now, that's a direct conflict to what I've been told for five years. I've been told this for five years. This is, this is not at all what I'm seeing. And so, you know, but I had to have a willingness. I had to have a, a belief that there is, there, there's a part of the story that I'm missing. And until I can, and, until I can experience some of it, until I can, be, somebody can share something with me that makes it more personal to me, then I'm not, then I can read all the books I want. It's not going to really give me that personal connection and understanding. So fast forward, you know, that was, you know, I became an administrator in my fourth year there and was in grad school at the same time. So grad school is two years. So I graduate from grad school and I get a, a call from Heather, you know, you need to come over here, you know, meet me at this gas station real quick, you know, and I'm like, what are you doing, first? What are you doing in Chapel Hill? Um, and she's like, you just need to come with me. And so we drive across the street into this community where the people in this community on their own decided to throw me a graduation party. This is a public housing community with families who already don't have what most of us have outside of that community. Mm -hmm. He felt the need and, and the, the desire to do something for me. I was, I mean, I was a blubbering, just but that right there just showed me that, that it, it the, the, that personal connection is so important and it transformed how, even when stuff wasn't always perfect, you know, and the, the, the kids didn't, you know, would, would have a, a bad day at school or whatever. They trusted me. They trusted me. They, they were willing to work with me. But I also looked at that community as not a community of deficit. But I, had to, I had to look and see where do they have strength that I can leverage as an educator that I can bring them in. So you can't make it to the school for the school governor's committee. You have a little community center. Why don't we bring our school governor's committee and have it off campus, have it down here. That way y'all can be a part of. And, and you know, so it was just like, you know, how, how can we shift this, this dynamic and narrative? And so you know, that's my own personal experience and personal story. And so... To, to see the systemic change within an education system is, is got to be, you know, one that's born out of that same, to, to me, to, to see the, the, the broader change has got to be more than just policy and procedure. It's got to be a willingness to, to make tough decisions. If, if you know you've got people, you know, within a school staff that are, that, that are actively disenfranchising students, families, what, what are you doing to change that? Whether you help, develop the capacity with that person to see things differently and act differently, or let me say, you know, this is not the kind of school community that we're building here. I can't have you be a part of this community. Those are tough decisions. Those are hard things to do. But if you're going to see change, then that's what you need to do. Because every educator in that building, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a counselor, whether you're a principal, whether you're an instructional assistant, whether you're, you know, someone in another classified role, a custodian, a, someone who works in child nutrition, before and after school care, everybody touches and impacts and has a relationship with. And it's the kid who's having to negotiate all these relationships with all these different adults in the building. And so I think it's on us to find out how we can, can connect and keep them engaged and things of that nature. And I was just in a Zoom on Thursday, Friday, Friday, a, a, a district-wide principals meeting and um, we had breakout sessions and we were waiting for the breakout session where everybody's kind of being led into this breakout session. And, and one of the guys that just came back and rejoined the district after being gone for a bit um, said, Principal Wilson, Principal Wilson. And um, 
And he said, I just have to tell everybody that's on here already how Principal Wilson saved my life. And gave his little, his, uh, how he was in middle school, cutting up. He said, Principal Wilson was Teacher Wilson at the time. And Teacher Wilson walked me outside of her classroom and had a conversation with me. And that conversation flipped a switch in my brain of, whoa. And so, but she did it in a way that it wasn't demeaning, didn't minimize, didn't dismiss his experience, but in a way that helped him want to be different in her room and to respect the expectations that she had. We don't have to change our expectations of, you know, being a strong student, you know, treating people with respect, all these general principles and values that are just good principles and values no matter who you are. But we have to have, we have to be able to create a way to have kids buy into that and connect to that. And they're not going to do it if they don't believe that their values are part of that equation. You can't just say my values or your values. You have to be able to to really bring them into the fold. And she did that. She did it in a way that didn't disparage him, that didn't um, put him on blast, that didn't generalize him or pigeonhole him. He literally said as an adult, he said, that was a turning point for me. I was ready to be the cut up and the clown in the school. He said, but after that conversation, I went home and was like, eh, <laughs> I like what she said. I connect to what she said. So, um, so I, it is a daunting task because the one thing I can't do is I can't make you feel differently. I can only present you with information that hopefully will, will flip a switch in you to make you see, feel, hear differently, to be willing to be uncomfortable, to, to say, you know, to be honest and be able to say, I don't know everything. And, uh, um, and so, yes, so, so education has a long way to go still, just like the country does. I mean, you can bring it right, you know, that what I was saying about the country, you can bring to education. Um, I think it's great that, that to, to see, you know, districts and things like that be open and, and, and you know, take public stances to support, um, you know, matters of social justice, you know, from a national all the way down to what are you doing in your, in your school district. But, um, but yeah, it, it, I, I do think that it, it, it involves a lot of the people that, that are there. I mean, it, it, resources are great and all that kind of jazz. I mean, that's all good and, and, and whatnot, but, but I, I truly believe it is all about how we connect to others and, um, and, and how we you know, fold their values and their experiences into, the, into driving the solutions that we're looking for. Um, you know, if a kid's not engaged, why? You know, and, and what, what strengths does this person have that they can bring back and leverage and bring to the table versus just looking at them as a deficit? Um, you know, and so, so it's complicated, it's not easy, but, uh, but I, I don't think that, that absolves us from saying, well, because it's hard, we're just not gonna try. You know, we, we can't do that but we, but we do have to be honest that we're, we're, you know, we're not perfect at it. And there are a lot of gaps there. There are a lot of gaps here. And then and you look, I've spent my, my, all my years in elementary, but now I work, you know, I work with adults across, you know, elementary through high school. And I was just getting my, my fresh haircut for you yesterday. And, um, um, and uh, the, the person that was, that was cutting my hair, um, her, uh, one of her sister-in-law is a principal of a middle school here in Durham. And so we just started talking it up and whatnot. And, um, and then she just talking about another one of her family members used to be an SR at one of the high schools and just, how defeated he would feel by the time they get to high school and seeing how, how wide that gap of, of you know, interest in education had gotten for students and, and just feeling defeated. I mean, we've, you know, we've got to do something about that. I mean, it can't, but it can't just, we can't wait for high school. We can't even just wait for middle school. We've got to start that conversation early because I, I know for a fact that, um, the kids, you, you can't put it even past a kindergarten. They get it. They know right away whether you care or don't care. And, uh, and that will start them on this trajectory of who can I trust in school? You know, is school a safe place? Not physically safe, but mentally safe. You know? And, it, and it's, it's so much more than just, um, you know, doing fire drills and lockdown drills and keeping you physically safe. That's important too. But, but is, my, is me, is my, is my, uh, as a young black male in the school, is my young black male experience valued in the school? Is it one that um, that, that people are willing to to take on, even if even if it's not what your experience is? And so, um, 
that's a long, a long narrative about a, a, a much bigger issue, but, um, but I, I, I agree that there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you for that. Tell me this, uh, we don't have very much time, but I wanna get uh, this question in. So schools have SROs, it took me a long time to figure out what that was, the school resource officers in place. How are they different than law enforcement or how are they different from other disciplinary factors in schools? W what is the need for that and how, what does that say to young people that you have a school resource officer in almost every single school, public school? What does that mean? Um, and it's interesting. Um, when I was uh, when I was in high school, I don't ever recall there being an SRO, and um, um, and it wasn't until I was you know became a teacher and and again I spent my entire career in elementary. However, you know you go to a meeting at a high school because they have lots of you know programs and space and whatnot, and um, and so I, I did begin to to understand what SROs were. We you know and if an elementary school ever had an issue. We were always, uh, you know, the, the school district would say, well, you, here, here is sort of your assigned SRO from either a middle or high school that can help you if you have an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, so I think that there, you know, the, the, the idea that I had initially was that, you know, you know, you have a, a, a you know, a kid who's not following the rules, they, they trespass in the evening or they, they come on campus and they're, you know, graffitiing up the campus or whatever, you know, that. That's a direct link. You don't have to call the police. They're just kind of there. You can make it low key. Just say, hey, don't, you know, there, are, there can be a legal consequence to that. And then you, of course, there's an assumption that drugs are a big deal in high school. And so, you know, maybe they're just there for that. Um, you know, but again, how your consciousness, how my consciousness has shifted over time is like, wow, like, is it that pervasive? Like, I mean, is violence and drugs and all so pervasive that we have to have a, a law enforcement and a police officer in a school every day for the whole day um it, it it seems like you're 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 treating something that's not necessarily happening before it ever happens it's like it, you're like me taking a z-pack for an infection i don't have i mean it's kind of dumb and not to mention it then brings down my immunities anyway and then the z-pack's not gonna be helpful later when i actually do have an infection and so same kind of analogy like we keep treating stuff that may not even necessarily be this, be this pervasive issue and sending a visual and sort of, again, what, what do we value message as a school district or a school system to say, um, you know, we know y'all are gonna do bad things. So we're waiting for you. We're right here and we're waiting for you. We're ready for you. Yep. And so w without thinking about, like you, were, you alluded to this earlier, like, you know, we don't need to, you know, you know Law, we, we need somebody who can help enforce the laws, deal with violence and, and, and you know, these, you know, the atrocities that do happen in, in communities. But at the same time, when we're talking about a public school, high school, you know, why aren't we driving our funds more into, you know, folks who can, um, you know, help deal with any kind of mental health things that are happening within our schools? Um, you know, go beyond just your sort of your, your surface level you know, you know, drug and gang prevention conversations to really getting in there and really, you know, again, building those relationships and knowing where your kids come from, and going beyond the school building of just seeing a dude walking around with a, a uniform, a badge, a gun and cuffs to what is this person doing to help me, you know, stay engaged in my education? What are they, what are they doing for my community outside of here? I mean, you, you could have this amazing powerful liaison between law enforcement and communities through the school, but it is not viewed that way. And it's not, it's not become, it does not seem to me. And again, I've never been in a high school, but um, I'm working in a high school, but uh, it doesn't seem to me that the, the purpose is that it seems more of a, they're there in case something bad happens versus they're there to help build these, uh, these relationships and, um, and, you know, and, and increase that, um, uh, that relationship within the community so so I, I again i think that the i think the purpose behind uh, having an sro um unfortunately at this point we've and again we've seen way too much visual evidence of they are trained to react in a certain way they are trained to use a certain set of tactics and things like that even though it's supposed to be like they're they're just there as a you know just for those specifically criminally illegal things but 
that doesn't seem to be what happens on a regular basis. They get involved in things that, um, that they don't necessarily need to be involved in. There are school level things that a school should be handling, whether it's through their social workers or their counselors or somebody else. But um, yes, I think that, I mean, I, I just like we talk about the police as a whole and um, you know, the idea that we need to, we, we need to approach the, the, the lens of law enforcement and broaden it to, you know, we're not just talking about law enforcement, but we're talking about supporting and, and providing the support to be able to de-escalate and deal with things before it turns into, you know, knees on necks, shooting, you know, bags over people's heads. If somebody's going to spit on you, don't put a bag on their head, just get out of the way. I mean, you know, it, these are things that, I mean, there, there are other ways that people can be trained, um, to, to handle situations through de-escalation and things like that and, and connections with people um, that, that don't have to involve law enforcement. I mean, I mean it, it, I, I've certainly, I've been in school with elementary kids. I've, one of the schools I worked in, it was a high needs population of kids who had a lot of stuff happening, but you know, it was more helpful to them for, for them to have the trust to be able to talk to me about it so I could connect them to the resources that could help them or help their family, you know, it's the village, right? Like we're not, we're not here to, you know, I'm not here to put you down because you got this going on. What can I do to help you? And, um, and so I think an SRO just does not, does not send that image, nor, do it, nor, nor does it seem that it's, um, you know, that, that seems to be their purpose. Um, and that's just purely from an outsider's view. I mean, my daughter's a small, it's a middle high school, but so they don't have an SRO that's there on the regular. They have somebody who's a part of their school, but. I don't know if I see them there all the time, um, but they're there from time to time. And, um, she's pretty ambivalent about it, but um, but uh, but yeah, I think there's I think there could be some shifting in that uh, that narrative, just like it, you know, we're talking about law enforcement as a whole in the country. Thank you so much, Nathan, for talking to me. We have about five minutes. I'm gonna leave the remainder of the time to you to say whatever you want to say that I didn't cover or that we didn't discuss. Um, once the video is converted, I'll send you a link to this video and you can let me know if I may upload it. So thank you again. I am very grateful. Thank you. And uh, please. No, I, the, the, I, the gratitude is definitely uh, uh, just an abundance over here as well. Um, you know, I, it's always been a, um, for me personally, it's always kind of been a tightrope of, you know, I, I've, I've work, I work in a profession where, you know, we are, we are public servants, right? Like we are, we are thrust out into the public eye and, you know, how do you balance, um, you know, creating an environment where, where people feel inclusive regardless of what your, you know, what, what your beliefs and political beliefs are and all this kind of stuff, but at the same time, not sacrificing my what, what I feel after those the, those principles that I have to live by that um, that don't allow me to um, to watch something that's not right happen and not say something about it you know how, how it's always a fine line of keeping people in the conversation and keeping you know people connected without um, you know without creating chaos in my own head so to speak um, and so. Finding ways to, but, but, but I, I've certainly more recently, I've just found like, I, you know, there, there's such a polarized view on things that um, I find it harder and harder to, to just hope that somebody will get it or, um, or not try to engage them now. You know, it may not, it may not be like, a, I'm not a huge fan of doing it on social media, but at the same time, I'm, even when, if, if anybody says anything about the little mundane things that I talk about, um, if, if, if there's anything that gets put out there that's just not right, I, I, I have to say something. You know, I can't just ignore it. I can't just hide that comment. Um, it's got to be said so that people understand that that's not what I stand for. And, um, um, and then, you know, try to come back around to a personal conversation because, again, that, that's where I really feel like the weather rubber hits the road. Um, so so I, I'm grateful for opportunities like this to be able to continue the dialogue to, to – um, you know, to be able to, to speak my truth as we've been taught to do and, um, and to be okay with that. And, um, and so I've never, you know, I've certainly not in, in anything that would be shared widely, um, you know, put anything out there to this, this depth of this degree. So, um, but it's you, Rochelle, and, and, and you, you and Skip and our families have developed this, 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 
trust and love and understanding to where we know that we can uh, we can come together and 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 be able to be happy, be sad, uh, be be afraid, be angry around each other, and and know that we are still here and and trying to um, you know to do that next right thing to be able to uh, to make the world a little bit better tomorrow than it was today. And um, and so I was just grateful uh, that that you reached out to 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 provide this platform and opportunity for us to have a dialogue and for. Um, and, you know, and again, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where wh whatever ways I can do to help add to the conversation, I'm no expert, but, uh, but can only speak from my experience, but, um, but if, if it can be helpful to anybody in any way, shape or form, then, then it was worth it. And, um, so I'm just grateful for the opportunity as well. Thank you very much. We're glad that there are Hesters in the world. We're glad. Right on. Thank you so much. And uh, you'll get a link of this video very shortly. Thank you again. And I can't wait for the day for me to see Maria. She's 15. God, you're yeah, old. she's driving. Yeah. yeah, you are old. You know, that yes. hasn't happened to me yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, you know, after all, she's probably not going to want any fruit. She's going to want something else, you know, so. Look, she's, she, her new thing is fruit smoothies. Nick, she's gone from just eating the, the the raw fruit to now she's making. She got a found one of Heather's cookbooks. It's a smoothie book, and she's just been. So I've been spending more money on fresh fruit these days than I, I probably have in a long time. But it's uh, again, I, I'll take it. It's all worth it. Absolutely, she's a lovely young woman, and we're, we're glad that she's a part of our family. And tell her I, I will send her some fruit. Maybe I'll send her one of those. Uh, Edible arrangement. <laughs> yeah, that right there. Maybe I'll send her that since I can't see her. But uh, thank you again. And I really appreciate it. And please tell everyone we said hello. We'll do it. We love you a lot. We love you right back. Bye. Bye. Bye.